Good morning and welcome to all that are gathered here together today in the Lord's house on this the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. We also want to uh, offer a warm welcome to all who are joining with us today by way of our live stream. And again, we give God thanks and praise for all the different ways that we are this little Berea Lutheran Church and Agape Hill Church have been able to proclaim the gospel in, in uh, unique and uh, numerous ways throughout uh, the city of Milwaukee and, and throughout, really, the, the nation and the world. Uh, and so uh, with that, we are going to, uh, we're going to take a little detour today away from our gospel lessons, where all of our meditations have been on the gospel uh, for the last number, the last couple of months, and we are going to focus on uh, a couple of phrases that we see in our uh, epistle lesson today. So may God bless your worship as we gather on this day and hear His word and receive His precious body and blood. And we begin with our opening hymn. Glory be to God on high. 
O oh Lord, grant us wisdom to recognize the treasures that you have stored up for us in heaven, that we may never despair, but always rejoice and be thankful for the riches of your grace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our first two weeks. The first of those readings that's appointed for this day comes from Ecclesiastes and will be in both the first and the second chapters. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanities of vanities. All is vanity. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. And I have applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I have toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill, must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man for all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person than he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading comes from our continuous reading through uh, Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. We're now in the third chapter. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for our hallelujah and the reading of the Holy Ghost. Thank you.
is recorded in the Gospel of St. Luke, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, the Lord. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. When he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to be O Christ. Let us together as a family of faith, confess our holy Christian faith as we proclaim together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of our last saints. Amen. You may be seated for our hymn of the day, but I do encourage you to rise on the final verse because it is a Trinitarian verse. <laughs>
you can see by the, uh, all the music that we have today, by all the readings today, um, this should be a, a day where our theme would be probably stewardship related, or, uh, or it could be something where that focuses on the work that we are doing uh, in serving our neighbor, especially uh, as, you, as you sung that first hymn, as you sung this hymn, maybe through the work in our garden. You know, there's all of those kind of things that are going on. We could have, we could have gone in the direction of, uh, of, you know, the utilization of the gifts that God has provided this church rather than storing them in barns. And, uh, and just kind of hanging on to them for our own good uh, will and for our, and, you know, and for our future, you, you know, our, you know, kind of our future comfort. There's all these kind of directions that we could have gone with this, this theme. And as you can tell by the way the service is laid out, that was my plan. But Thursday it changed, and and it changed. Part of it is because. We have, uh, we have uh, looked at this text while, during these uh, years that I've been here three times now, and during those three times, that's the way that we, we saw all of these texts. But I got thinking about something early Thursday morning, and of course that caused me to have to redo what I was planning on doing before our church. So actually, I take it back. It was early Wednesday morning because I had to change before Luther Dan. And, uh, and I got thinking about this, and it was, uh, you know, it was that, it came up across on, on something I heard on the radio, where somebody was talking about a mountaintop experience that they had had. Mountaintop experience. You've heard the term before, right? It is, it, it's interesting, it's one of those terms, kind of like what we talked about a couple of weeks ago with the term Good Samaritan. That it is a term that is truly a biblical term, but that our secular world has kind of taken it and run with it for all of these years. It's interesting when we when we talked about uh, Good Samaritan a couple of weeks ago. That next Monday morning on the news, there was somewhat a story that they said was a Good Samaritan story. It was amazing. But now we're talking about mountaintop experience. And, and mountaintop experience, of course, comes from the transfiguration story, right? Uh, uh, Peter, James, and John up on the mountain. Jesus is transfigured. They see Elijah and Moses. They're blown away by this. They don't even know what to do. They don't know what to say. Mountaintop experience. We see other forms of mountaintop experience. Uh, we saw one uh, a couple of weeks ago here with uh, uh, the 72 being sent out. Jesus sends them out to proclaim the kingdom, to uh, heal, to cast out demons. And they go, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, that uh, it worked. And they were so amazed by all of this. That for them, it was a life-changing experience. And if you remember Jesus' words to them, don't be caught up in the mountaintop experience. Be joy-filled because your name also is written in the book of life. Mountaintop experiences. Well, it was also a few weeks ago, over the course of this last month, that we talked, uh, that we brought up one of the previous themes of the National Youth Gathering, Live Love. Remember, we, we have that as one of our themes. And we talked about the fact how just it was just a few weeks ago that we had 18,000 of our young people that went down to Houston, and they were going to be part of this amazing experience. And that many of them would come away from that with what would be considered a mom. It would be something that uh, in the lives of young people and even in the lives of adults, it would change their life. Well, they came back from there, and we heard from some of the adults at some of our churches that same thing. Not just that the children, the, the, the high schoolers were changed, but these adults were changed. 
life-changing experiences. The thing about mountaintop experiences, though, is that eventually you've got to come down off the mountain. It happened with Peter, James, and John, didn't it? All of a sudden, the transfiguration was gone, and here's the, the, the scripture says it's just Jesus standing there. Elijah and Moses are gone. And what happens is they walk down off of the mountain in this mountaintop experience, and they are walking now to a cross where Jesus will suffer and die. Mountaintop experience with those young people. It's the most amazing worship services and, and gatherings that you ever want to experience if you've never had an opportunity to be at a youth gathering or, 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 or watch one. They had to go home from there. And they come back to places like Berea or any other church, and now all of a sudden it's the same old church service again. It's repeating the same things over and over. It's hearing the same pastor talk that they heard for all of those years before they went there. They had to come down off the mountain. I want to share something with you today. And uh, there's, a, there's another mountaintop experience that we have all experienced. And yet, I think that, that oftentimes we don't realize what is in the midst of that mountaintop experience. And we have come off the mountain for so long that we were completely lost to the experience. So I want to try to share it with you in this way. It's a scenario that I want to kind of place before you. My guess is none of you have ever experienced it in this way, but I want you to picture yourself in the midst of this story today. First, I'm going to ask you, have any of you ever taken a Holy Lands tour to, throughout Israel and Jerusalem and all of those kinds of things? Be baptized in the Jordan River, any of that? I didn't think so. Okay. I haven't gone either, but I, let's together today, we're going to do this by way of, of our own mind. Okay, so I want you to picture this. Picture that we, as this group here today, that we are flying now to Tel Aviv. Okay, you can picture yourself, you can picture that it's a long flight there. And, and so one of the things I'm going to ask as this, as this mission group or as this, uh, this Holy Land tour group, I'm going to say, so what are you most looking forward to in our time in Israel? And, and my guess is, without missing a beat, there's going to be at least one of you, if not more, that are going to say, I can't wait to get baptized in the Jordan River. And so then I would kindly have to remind you that you already have ties. And you're going to say, well, well then getting re-baptized in the Jordan River. And then I'm going to have to kindly remind you that God has forgotten his promises in the waters of holy baptism, so there is no need to be rebaptized. Well, you're on that plane, and this is what you wanted to do. So you're not real happy with me. And so you say to me something like this, so then, Lord, so then, Pastor, what should I call it? I want to wear the robe. I want to, I want to wade out into the river. I want to get dumped. After all, it's been a long time since I've been back. I don't even remember it. I was a little child at the time. I don't, I don't know what it was even like. So, how, what do I call it? And so, I would say, well, how about let's call it remembering your baptism? How does that sound? How about if you and I, where we go out there, we'll put the white robes on, we will bathe down into the water, and you're going to get dumped under the water, and you are going to remember your baptism, and you are going to remember the promises that God has made to you. Well, now that smile comes back, and you're kind of getting excited about this again, and uh, you show, and you kind of, 
are beginning to experience it already in your mind what this is going to be like. We can summarize these words from First Corinth or from Colossians chapter three with that phrase, remembering your baptism. Here's how Paul begins. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Remember your baptism. And specifically, I want you to focus on two phrases that Paul has here. The phrase, you have died, and the phrase, you have been raised. Verses 3, verses 1. You have died, you have been raised. You have died, and you have been raised in baptism. So remember your baptism. Paul here is building on what we had in our text last week from Colossians chapter 2, that you have been buried with him, that is with Jesus in baptism, in which or by which you were also raised with him. That was our text last week. So we can say God gifts us with the death and the resurrection of Jesus through baptism. But it doesn't feel like it because we've come down off the mountain. You have died, and you have been raised. You were buried, and you were raised in baptism. Remember your baptism. First, you were buried. You have died. Under the waters of baptism, you died with Jesus on that There we are. We're on the shore of the Jordan River. You and I, we, we have our white robes on. There's a few other uh, brave pilgrims that are out there with us in the water. There are some other people that are kind of there. They're going to stay on dry ground. They're just going to be taking pictures. So now you kind of step tentatively out onto the slippery rock that's on the edge of the Jordan River. And you don't allow your imagination to think too much about what else is in that river because it's not the prettiest. So we wait out there where the water's about waist deep. Can you picture yourself there? I remind all of you that you have been and you already are baptized child of God and that today we are remembering that promise. In baptism, we have been crucified with Christ. In baptism, we have died. In baptism, we were buried. And in baptism, we were baptized into Jesus' death. And after I share that with you, I would say, are you ready? And you, of course, yes, I am definitely ready for that. And, and then before you go under, you're going to hear these words. You have been and you are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then my hand will be on your back and my other hand will be on your forehead. And down you go. Down you go in the water. Can you picture yourself there in that water, that very moment? Freeze that in your mind, that very moment when you have been put down into that water. The shock of the water is going to make your chest tighten because it's really cold. And it's so cold that you want to yell. But the water is so gross that you don't want to open your mouth. You instinctively shut your eyes for that moment, and you're numb. You're not breathing. You're under the water. You're laid on your back. 
And yet the whole world has gone black for that moment. In that momentary drowning, the world has ceased. Life has ceased and everything is numb. There is no light, there is no sound, there is no feeling, it is just cold and dark. That's what it's like to die. Under the waters of baptism, you died with Jesus on that cross. Paul says here in Colossians 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. That is what God does in baptism. According to his word of promise, it is his last day of judgment our human rebellion has already been poured out on Jesus on that cross. And in your baptism, you have participated in that dying. Now that image of being dumped and that sensation of that temporary drowning, it highlights what happens with even a sprinkle or a splash of water. Because it's not the amount or the source of the water. But it's the word of the promise of God and it's the very work of Jesus Christ that causes that dying. Under the waters of baptism, you died with Jesus on that cross. But that moment of death, it's only a passing moment. For you now feel the force of my hand, the one that's supporting you here, not the one that's pushing you down here, the one that is supporting you here is going to pull you up. And you're going to emerge from this water, eyes upward. You're drawing in this great big breath of air. And under that drenched white robe, you find yourself shivering with life. I want you now to freeze that moment just for a minute here in your mind's eye. Your face has just emerged from this water. Your arms are flung back. Your, your palms are outward like this. Your mouth is open. Your lungs are eagerly filling with your first breath. In that moment, you are an image of God's promise. You have that image in your mind? Emerging from the waters of holy baptism, you rise with Jesus to new life. You emerge from those waters of holy baptism, and you rise with Jesus. In baptism, you have been raised with Christ. In baptism, you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, Colossians chapter 2. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too walk in newness of life, Romans chapter 6. It is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you, Galatians chapter 2. In Christ Jesus, you are a child of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. Galatians chapter 3. He saved us not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Titus chapter 3. Baptism now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal for, oh, to God for a clean conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3. You see, this image of rising up out of the water, clean and refreshed and invigorated and regenerated and reborn, it highlights what happens even with a sprinkle or a splash. Because it's not the amount, it's not the source of the water. But it is the word and the promise of God and the very work of Jesus that causes that rising. And emerging from those waters of baptism, you rise with Jesus to new life. That's the 
the mountaintop experience, folks. And each and every one of us have experienced that. But then something happens. You get a towel and you dry off. And you get dressed. And you finish the rest of the tune. Well, on the front flight back, you're going to take a break, maybe from your journaling. You're going to come to me and you're going to say, Pastor, how can I hold on to all of this? And I say, what do you mean? And, and you say, the baptism or the remembering of my baptism, that feeling of dying and rising again. How do I hold on to this? It was a once-in-a-lifetime trip, and I can't come back to the Jordan River every time I need a refill. And I respond back to you, no, I can't. Nor do you need to. And it would probably become a problem anyways if, if you felt that you had to go back there each and every time because it's not the source of the water that makes a baptism. It's not the amount of water. It's not even the experience itself. It's the Word of God and the promise of God And so I would say to you then, can you picture that baptismal font in church? And I can say to you today, you see that baptismal font that is here in church? You can look at it right now if you want. Because there it is. And I'm going to ask you something. I'm going to ask you next Sunday. I want you to look at it. Again, I want you to look at it as you come into this sanctuary next Sunday. And then I'm going to ask you again to look at it two more times during the church service. Because you see, when you were under that water, cold and dark and not breathing, it was an experience of what it is true, not just in that one-time baptism, but it is also true in our daily repentance. Under the waters of baptism, you die with Jesus on the cross. So, during that time of confession, when we speak those words, I, a poor, miserable sinner, I want you to look at that font, and I want you to remember that under the waters of baptism, you die with Jesus on the cross. And then again, during the absolution, when you hear God's words of forgiveness declared to you for Jesus' sake, instead of closing your eyes or watching me speak or looking at the words that are printed for you in your worship folder, I want you next week to look at that font, to remember the image and the sensation of coming up out of the water that you had in your mind today. That as your body shivered and your lungs were filling with air and life, it was an experience of not just what is true in our one-time baptism, but it is also true in our daily life of faith and trust. Emerging from the waters of baptism, you rise with Jesus. What does such baptism with water indicate? Our small catechism says this. It indicates that the old Adam in us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all sin and evil desire, and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Remember your baptism in the precious name of Jesus. May that peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. And the life everlasting. As our gifts and tithes and offerings are being brought forth to the altar, let us sing the offer for it created me a clean heart. <laughs>
that page of our uh, prayer insert today. Uh, those that are facing challenges of body and mind and soul, those that are experiencing the celebration of birthday and anniversaries, I want to add two names uh, that uh, didn't have an opportunity to make it to this list. I'd like to add our uh, music director for our Agape Hill Church, Emily Samuela, who uh, this last week broke her thumb uh, on her hand. We certainly want to remember uh, her as she uh, begins her healing process. And also, uh, we would like to lift up uh, Sean Hecker. Sean is the son of Shirley Hecker. Sean is a, a, a child of Maria Lutheran Church. He is hospitalized right now with Lyme disease, uh, and they believe that Lyme disease is affecting his heart. And we certainly want to remember Sean and the whole family uh, as he uh, continues to be uh, under doctor's care and continuing in his healing process. Let us pray. Oh, please rise for that prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for your word and spirit, that our hearts may be guided against pride and arrogance, and that we may be wise to love rightly all that you have made, be used for your purpose and for your glory. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, yes. We pray for your church, that you would give her honorable and noble men for the office of holy ministry, gracious and devoted men and women commissioned for teaching arts, for works of charity within your church, and for faithful members who serve you by serving their neighbor. We especially lift up this week uh, Mount Calvary Lutheran Church and School and Pastor Dan Chaplesky. We ask, Lord, that you keep them steadfast in their faith, that they continue to be bold in their witness. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For all husbands and wives, that they would live in fidelity to their vows and promises. We especially uh, remember on this day uh, uh, Dan and Destiny Sando as they uh, uh, entered the the, uh, their marriage vows yesterday. Uh, we also lift up parents as they teach their children to know and love the Lord. We pray for single adults that they may find fulfillment in their service to others. We pray for our lives together that we might show the love of Christ to one another. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our nation and its leaders, that as kingdoms rise and fall and leaders are raised up and brought low by your will, we may recognize the vanity of all of our plans and so be ready to rejoice and give thanks for your every good gift in the days that you give us under the sun. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the suffering, the dying, and the grieving, especially Carol, Cindy, Julia, Kathy, Lorraine, Leah, Garrett, Rick, Sean, the family of Darlene, Dan, Emily, Levon, Bev, Maxine, Janice, Karen, Audrey, Helena, Henry, Pablo, Janelle, Tracy, Larry, Will, Meredith, Mandy, Paul, Jean, Rose, Eleanor, Mert, Lorraine, Tony, Joan, Byer, and Nadine. That they would be sustained in the truth that their lives are even now hidden with Christ in God, and that when He appears, they will also appear with Him in glory. And for compassionate and skillful doctors and nurses, that suffering may be alleviated, and minds and bodies return to health. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who celebrate birthdays and anniversaries, for Suella and Vicki and Vida and Michael and Barbara, that you would keep them steadfast in their faith and in their baptismal promise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Answer all doubt and fear, O Lord, with confidence in your word and sacraments. 
that by these means of grace we may be kept in holiness and guarded from temptation and despair until the day when you bring all things to their perfect fulfillment and we are delivered to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is meet and right and salutary. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. <laughs>
one of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep and preserve you in the true faith. The life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. <laughs>